Hey, it's Wednesday, December the 15th. This is Open Mics with Dr. Stites. I'm Steve Stites coming to you from the Dahl Simons Family Studio here at the University of Kansas Health System. Back in the saddle again. Oh, wait a minute. There's a song about that. Back in the saddle again. Happy to be here and be here with all of you. We plan to bring you a story of medical advancement for patients with essential tremors, which is a really big deal. But we're going to wait on that story because the pandemic kind of took precedence. It's a pretty big news week, and we wanted to hit some stuff around that. We've got some great experts here to have that conversation. Across the region, we are seeing a steep climb in the number of COVID admissions, creating challenges in healthcare yet again. Joining us to talk about the current COVID climate is Catherine Satterwhite, Region 7 Health Administrator for the Health and Human Services, as well as Dr. Nathan Barr, Infectious Disease Physician, and Chelsea Smith, Outreach and Communications Coordinator with the Community Blood Center. They all have something to share about the impact this surge is having, and as you can guess, it's probably not been good. Jessica is also standing by to take your questions. Make sure to get your questions sent into this on YouTube, Facebook, and the medicalnewsnetwork.org. You can find the links right here on your screen. Dr. Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control, is going to be joining us shortly with our numbers. Hint, they're worse. Before we start our conversation, though, do we have any reporter questions today? Okay, I'm not hearing anything. Okay, guys, I'm just going to turn to our guests here. I'm a little nervous. Let me just show a couple of graphs here if I can for just a minute. First, let's look at our heat map. So we show this periodically. And, and if you go back uh, a few months or a few weeks ago, we were showing you. Remember how the West was kind of on fire and now it's settling down into New Mexico, Colorado, et cetera, calmed a little bit. Montana calmed down a little bit. But look at the North, the Northeast, and sort of what I call the Near East, sort of the Ohio area. And then look at what's happening as it reaches from Iowa into Missouri, Kansas. It is just finding its way and it's going south. This is a concerning map. And what should also concern us is reports that the CDC released yesterday that the Omicron variant is now about 13% of cases in Region 2. We're going to talk about that in a moment in Region 2, but in New York, Region 2 includes New York and New Jersey. We also are seeing evidence that um, the Omicron spread doubles every two to three days. That's a remarkable spread, so much faster than what we've seen with any of the other variants, including the Delta variant. We also know this fact. If you've been vaccinated, you are five times less likely to get COVID and 13 times less likely to have severe hospitalization and death. You're going to ask, is that going to be true about Omicron? We don't know yet, but early data suggests that that's probably still true. But we've got a bigger conversation to have. And this map should worry us all. Look at the rise in that curve and look at where we are. Look how steep that curve is. That's our local rate. Look at how fast it's going up back in the biggest surge we've had, then in the surge we had just recently, and now look at where we are. I don't know how anybody else feels, but I'm really nervous, and I'm nervous about a couple of reasons. First of all, hospitals are already full and brimming. We had our chief medical officer call yesterday. We're gonna have a big discussion around this on Friday. Um, I'm just going to warn everybody, things are on fire, and we've said that before, but we try not to flapjack. We don't flap with the truth. We don't uh, flap our arms. We don't jack with the truth. We just try to tell you where things are. This is a different time, folks, than the differences caused by first. We have influenza now. RSV is still out there. Parainfluenza is out there. And a difficult rhinovirus. Hospitals are full. They're full, full, full. One of our folks up in Liberty, the Chief Medical Officer Regu Adega, will be with us on Friday. Um, uh, talked about how busy they are. We know that one of the, the HCA hospitals they're talking about that, that they actually had a lot of patients just in their emergency room with COVID. We're hearing about that on Friday as well. We we know that things are difficult, and we have a lot of COVID patients, and the numbers are ra rising rapidly, just as Omicron comes in, and people do not have their masks on, and what else are they doing? They're gathering indoors. This is a challenging time. This may be, I think, this will be our greatest challenge because we're so darn tired of it and we're so darn tired of following the rules. And I think this has the potential to cause the greatest problem, and not just for COVID, but for all the other people who are sick and have a time-sensitive diagnosis where they can't get care. I think our communities need to re realize where we are the dangers that we have in the hospitals and where and how our ability to take care of you and what that means for all of your medical care, not only your COVID care. So uh, we're going to get into that conversation. 
So let's talk about that. First, Dr. Catherine Satterwhite. What's your sense of the numbers? What do you feel going on, on around the region? So um, one of the most concerning things from my perspective, like, like you mentioned, is the increase in the number of patients who are admitted with COVID-19 each day. Um, case rates are something that we, we use a little bit as an early warning sign, but we know they're not perfect. Um, and we know that, for instance, Omicron may not be quite as severe in terms of outcome development. However, the transmissibility is very important, which I think we'll talk about probably later too. But what I really look at is people who are experiencing severe outcomes due to infection, and that's reflected in first hospital admissions and second deaths. So when I see those hospitalization numbers going up across all the four states I work with, Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, and Kansas, it's very, very concerning for me. Yeah, I, and, and is that why you dressed in black today? Because I'm impressed in the holiday season. I've got my little tie on. It's got a little cute reindeer, red. You're on all in black. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. So A, I'm a little bit like a ninja. Um, but B, okay, she just called I think, herself herself a ninja. Post. That's right. I'm thinking Johnny Cash. <laughs> I mean, probably that too. And also, wearing black is super easy. So okay, there you when go. we're How really busy, where's that, where's that song? Uh, I'm, I'm going to stay. Um, I'm the man. You're not the man in black. I remember that song. Did I great mean, Johnny, Johnny Cash, Cash and I are pretty much the same person. Okay, well, I, yeah. that, that's an interesting commentary on being a ninja. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I mean, you guys have your nice white coats. It's just a little contrast. Okay, I like the kind that that, that works. Go. Okay, so what is this Region Two thing? Yeah, what's okay. going on in Region Two, and why is thirteen percent of their cases now Omicron? That is a warning sign to us all. So, um, first, Region Two. So, from a Health and Human Services perspective, the country is divided into ten regions. So, I'm the regional health administrator for Region Seven, and as I mentioned, it's those four states right in the Midwest. And those are the states that I work generally with health leadership on all, all sorts of public health things. But um, we also have uh, Region 2, which is a little bit of a, a weird region because they have New York and New Jersey and Puerto Rico Puerto and the Virgin Rico. Islands. Okay. Um, so and I know a lot, there's a lot of immigration from Puerto Rico to New York, New Jersey, so maybe that was why. Maybe, uh, but honestly, my, uh, my hypothesis would be that it's really probably driven by New York. Um, you know, we know that New York is a, is a global entry point. We generally, with a lot of infectious diseases, um, see them coming in from the coast. Uh, we see it either coming in from the West Coast or the East Coast and sort of moving into the middle of the country. So as a country, the most recent numbers showed that about 3% of all variants are Omicron. Um, but our sort, of, our sort of tip of the iceberg is probably that 13% which is the proportion of variants that are Omicron in that region too. That's a big number. It's a big number. And um, I, you mentioned the doubling. Um, and if we could talk for a minute just about the transmissibility Let's piece. Let's do it. It's supposed to be three or four times more transmissible, Dr. Barr. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it looks that way. It's, uh, it's, it's hugely concerning. I mean, I think when we talk about these mitigation efforts, masking and things like that, that's why that stuff matters so much, right? If it's only going to take a, a smaller amount to transmit the virus, then we really need to be cognizant of uh, our potential for being infected and, uh, and passing it along to others. Uh, you know, that's, that's what this is all about, and that's, that's a big concern for me. And this doubling rate, I mean, Delta had a doubling rate of five, six days, and Omicron's you know, maybe less than half of that. Yeah. A study out of London yesterday suggested that, that in 121 families that you are 3.2 times more likely to spread Omicron than Delta. Ouch. Yeah, and I think the other thing, I think it's going to be really easy for people to say, oh, it's not as bad because it doesn't make people as sick as frequently. But when we're looking at a huge volume of people getting sick, there are still people that will experience severe outcomes. So while it may not be as severe in an individual at a population level, um, a lot of people, if they get Omicron, um, if COVID-19, the Omicron variant, we're still going to see a tremendous burden in the hospitals. And I think that's an, actually a really important point. So let's dwell on that for just a moment. You look at the South African data and they say, okay, well, our hospitals aren't overwhelmed, but hospitals are really full and busy. 70% of the population had already had COVID. About 30% of the population has been vaccinated. So two things. First, being in, having COVID before did not protect you against the Omicron variant. That part seems to be an emerging story. Second of all, an emerging story appears to be that vaccination, especially with a booster, may be more helpful, mm -hmm. especially against hospitalization and death. 
The other third part of the story is that Omicron, the, some of the initial studies have been in younger folks. They're not hospitalized that frequently anyway. The unanswered question is what happens, especially in an unvaccinated older person with Omicron? I think the jury's completely out on that right now. And to your point, if it's so much more transmissible and a lot of people get it all at once, there will still be some people hospitalized. And that could be a real concern because you've already got Delta out there and you got Omicron coming in. That could be a really nasty storm, right? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, it could be. And, you know, the other thing that we're starting to see data emerge on is some of our therapies that we've been relying a lot on, these monoclonal antibody therapies, many of them are not going to be effective against Omicron. So um, that's a big concern to me because that is, has been keeping a lot of high-risk people out of the hospital for us. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to lose most likely two of our products um, that we've been using quite a bit. Um, so, you know, there's a concern there. And, and I also worry, you know, are we going to end up in a situation where uh, supply is really going to tank real fast on us? Those are all concerning. And then you mentioned the deal about boosters. Um, there's, you know, data just presented uh, yesterday from, from a big South African private health insurance network. And uh, this is essentially showing, you know, a drop in, in efficacy in a two-dose regimen of the Pfizer vaccine down to about 70% for hospitalization prevention. So that's, you know, that's down quite a bit from where it was. Booster, we hope, can help that. So this is just another reason. If you haven't, you know, if you're eligible to be boosted, you haven't done that yet, get that third dose. Yeah, you're in your window before we have a lot of Omicron in the city. Well, I think there probably is in Kansas City already, but it's not a lot yet. Yep. Go get your booster right now yep, <laughs> this right. is the day to do Today. it i think yep okay so um talk to us a little bit about supply chain out there yeah how's it doing um so you mentioned monoclonal antibodies a couple of months ago we were we were really starting to get to a point where there was a pinch in the supply chain um, and what um, the federal government did is we actually pulled back from what we call sort of a direct order system where so ku could order directly however much they product they needed which is how you know, therapeutics work in general. Um, but we felt like from a federal government perspective, we needed to make sure that there was equitable distribution because what we were seeing was some places pulling a lot more and really making it hard for everybody else. So we are still in this model where states are allocating product to different facilities across their state. You know, states um, and local health departments know what's going on in their area. And that's been a really good way for us to get it out. Good, the good news is um, product is much more available than it was in the past. Um, the, the supply seems to be a much, much more stable and has caught up. Um, we're also doing a better job as a country and not letting product just sit on shelves. We had, a, we had a little bit of a problem with people having a lot of supply and they were using it, but they weren't using it all where other people didn't have any that they were using. So our supply is actually looking a lot better. Um, it'll be really interesting, as Dr. Barr said, to see uh, when we get data to know how effective these monoclonal products are among Omicron. But we do know they still work against Delta, which is still the predominant strain. Um, you know, it might change quickly, um, but it also might, might, might t hit some balance, too. We might see some equilibrium, too. So supply is good. Um, we do have some new therapeutics coming out. Um, those will be in limited supply when, when and if they are approved by the FDA and made available. The most exciting one is a long-acting injectable monoclonal antibody that's put out by AstraZeneca. Um, and it is something that can be given to people who don't mount a good immune response. And I'm going to let Dr. Barr explain yeah. that. Well, this is especially for true for transplant patients, yep. people on chemotherapy. Yep. It is exciting. I think the other ones, I think Paxlovid is the I most think... exciting. So we can debate which one's because the best. We, but they're both yeah. really one good. At a time, one let's at go. A time. Let's go. Okay. And monoclonal antibodies. So yeah. let's talk about the antibodies. Yeah, I mean, these are, this is really so. different from the antibodies we have right now. So what we've been using monoclonal antibodies for at, at KU really has been only treatment. And that's, you know, it is. A, a situation where you can use it post exposure so if you're a person at high risk and you're exposed to covid you can use in that situation we just haven't had the the room to do it we've had so much need for it um, we've we've not been able to treat folks in that way so we've been only doing it for treatment and this is very different this is designed for people that uh, are suspected to potentially not have a great response to the vaccination because of immune suppression so be they transplant patients people on chemotherapy um, a, the number of other medications that could qualify. 
And the idea is you give this medicine, it stays in the system for six months or so and provides some, some degree of protection from hospitalization and, and things like that. So it's exciting and, and you know we'll see how much supply we get of it. We've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes to try to prepare for this and to try to make sure we can get it to as many patients uh, as possible right away. Of course, um, we, we expect that we won't have nearly enough to, to give it to all the people that could benefit probably. But it's exciting. It is exciting to think you can give an antibody. You can do it in the doctor's office. It is an injection. Um, so that's yeah. not always the most fun part. But uh, it's an uh, intramuscular injection. But it's like getting another shot. Right. And um, may really help prevent disease. That was yep. a big deal on, the, on the, yep. the degree of prevention that it had. So that's really important. And we think it's going to be effective against Omicron. Yeah. That, I mean, that's the hope, right? That's sort of, a, you know, based on the mutations, things like that right now, that there's hope that it will work well against Omicron. Um, you know, that has to be proven, but that's that's the hope. And um, we'll see. Yep. Get fingers see. crossed. Okay. So the other big one is Paxlovid, which is just a, it's a pill. It's like taking Tamiflu for uh, influenza. It's taken twice a day for four, uh, five days, four days, five days. I think it's five. And, um, and 85 to 89% reduction in severe hospitalization and death, which was what the preliminary data from Pfizer said. But they just said they've finished their study now, finished looking at the data, they submitted to the FDA, and they said it's held. Yeah. And the other one, the Molnupavir, they said, oh, it's 50 for my Merck. 50 percent, but then it dropped to 35 percent, 30 percent in their final analysis, plus some side effects are a little concerning. Paxlovid, according to Pfizer so far, and so far Pfizer's been pretty accurate in what they said about their vaccine, et cetera, yeah. so maybe this will be true. we got to see final data. we got to look at the research studies. But if it holds true, that there's an 89% reduction in hospitalization death with very few side effects with a therapy that's pretty common. We know anti-protease inhibitor, or protease inhibitors pretty well. That's a big deal, Dr. Barr. Yeah, that would be a big deal. And, and, you know, this data is primarily in unvaccinated populations. They have a study that they've talked a little bit about in vaccinated populations. So uh, there looks like there's potentially some hospitalization benefit there, but this is uh, we need more data on that too, um, but it, man, yeah, if, if we can help people to keep out of the hospital, we're we're all for it, right? This is going to be a drug that's a little tricky though, because you mentioned we have experience with protease inhibitors, this type of antiviral, and uh, and one of the components of this drug, it can mess with some other medications. So it's going to be one that you know your doctor is going to need to look at real closely to see if it's a problem for you or not. So for supply chain around something like that, because I know there's going to be a lot of demand for it right out of the gate, especially if we're in the, if, if in fact, this drug gets approved by the end of December, first part of January, the surge is really at its peak. Lots of people are going to want it all at once. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, so as these new therapeutics have, have come into the arena that they're, they're being submitted to the FDA for emergency use authorization, we've gone through an extensive planning process to try to understand all the different pathways that we need to consider and what might work best to get it to people quickest. For instance, our pharmacies are, um, we have a huge pharmacy network. That was something that was really built out with the vaccine rollout way back a year ago, by the way, a year ago. Um, and so that, that's, a, that's a system that is ready. Um, you know, we know that these will be prescribed in outpatient settings a lot. Mm -hmm. So we'll need to consider um, a much different delivery mechanism than even we would consider with monoclonals, things mm -hmm. like that. But yes, the supply will, will likely be limited. I actually haven't seen the preliminary numbers for that. Um, but I'm certain that it will be, that, that there will be time needed to ramp up large scale manufacturing. Yeah, this is going to be tough. And you saw on our chief medical officer call yesterday, and, and uh, we're talking about some of the ramifications of having another surge again. First of all, everybody's tired. Mm. I think our staff are just exhausted. So, and, and, and yet the hospitals are full, a lot of folks in the waiting room. And then one of the chief medical officers said, and I'm, we're having trouble getting blood for surgeries. And we're like, yep, we know why. And so, Chelsea, you're back with us today. Welcome back. It's always a delight to have you. But I wish the news was better, but it sounds like Community Blood Bank, we have a shortage. Unfortunately, I'm hoping one day I'll be able to come on here and say, surprise, we don't have a shortage anymore, but it's been almost two years of this, so uh, no end in sight right now. We did go on emergency appeal last week, and we did see um, a small spike in blood donations, which was helpful. It did not get us to that five to seven day supply though, and we have two weeks of holidays ahead of us. So um, it's not, not looking good over here. So how many days, where are we right now? How many days of blood supply are we at? 
we're sitting around a three to four day supply. And yeah. like I mentioned, five to seven is our sweet spot right now. Um, so we're, we're getting there. We're close, except we're, we're expecting another drop next week uh, because of Christmas. So, yeah, we're hoping so, that uh, we can stay at that three to four. Jesse, what's the lower age limit for giving blood? 16. So in the states of Missouri and okay. Kansas, you can blood if you're 16 as long as you have parental permission and 17 um and up do not require parental permission so here's so i don't require parental permission anymore just barely of course but um what's the upper age limit chelsea let's see if i'm still eligible we actually don't have an upper age limit so as long as you're healthy and you uh have you know clearance from your doctor um and you're not on any medications that would defer you you can donate as long as you want and how do we know about what those medications might be or what kind of diseases would prevent us from getting giving blood? Yeah, we do have a wealth of information on our website at savealifenow.org uh, where you can look up some frequently asked eligibility questions about maybe w what medications you're on, whether that defers you if you've had um, diseases in your in your past medical history or current. Uh, we also have a medical hotline that you can call, um, which you can find online as well. and. Uh, if you have questions and aren't able to find those answers on our website, we would strongly encourage you to give us that call. Don't self-defer. Don't assume that you can't donate. Um, that's a huge reason why people don't come in is they just simply assume that they can't. And the reality of the situation is a lot of people can. Most medications do not defer you from being able to donate blood. So just give us a call. Let us have that conversation with you and see if you can donate. All right. So Chelsea, I'm, I'm 61, not yet 62. It is getting close. And um, I'm on like Nexium, a little uh, drug to help. You know, it's a it's a stressful time right now in COVID. And some vitamin D. Is that all going to be okay? Yep. Uh, most mostly, the only medications that are uh, big red flags for us are if you're on a blood uh, blood thinner. Obviously, we don't want you to uh, come in and donate blood. You might not stop bleeding. So uh, also heart medications, anything that's related to uh, your blood or blood pressure, that's something that we're going to have to look into a little more. Not all medications uh, for blood pressure or, uh, or heart issues are going to defer you, but some of them will. So we will pay attention to that when you come in. What about a remote history of cancer? Uh, yeah, if you have, if you are currently in remission, um, it depends on the type of cancer that you had. Uh, we do have some of those questions answered for you online. The FDA actually in 2020 released some new uh, blood donor revisions regarding people who have had cancer in the past. Um, leukemia used to be a lifelong deferral. It actually changed in, in uh, 2020 to a five-year deferral. So if you've been in remission for five years, um, and, and it's not just leukemia, there were a handful of other types of cancers that used to be lifelong deferrals that are no longer, uh, which is great. That's a whole new pool of donors that we can invite to come back and donate. Um, but uh, most cancers uh, at, at this point don't defer you as long as you've been in remission for a certain amount of time, which is usually three to five year uh, window All period. Right. So I, you know, I'm going to take a look at that. I'm going to try and come over next week. I'm an A negative donor. Will I be welcome? Yes, you will be welcome. All donors will be welcome at this point. <laughs> All right. Uh, we, you need your red blood cells if you're A-neg. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll try and be by next week. And I just want to say thanks again for giving the message and thanks for all the great work the Community Blood Bank does. I don't know how people, how, how well our audience understands this, but the Community Blood Bank, the folks, they are saving lives every single day. That life could be yours. They need your help. You want to save a life? Give a little blood. Someday that may save your life, too. Hawkeye, welcome back this morning. Yeah. Numbers are not as good, Hawk. Mm-mm. No. Other numbers are good if you're vaccinated. Yes, they are. That part's really big. That, let's hit that. Yeah. So we have 43 active infections, 11 in the ICU, and six of those ICU patients on the ventilator. We still have 21 additional patients in that recovery um, criteria. So a total of 64 patients. Our last death was on the 13th. But we should say that of those 43 active infections, only one is fully vaccinated. Um, and that patient is on the regular medical floor. It is, uh, they are not in the ICU. So. Yeah, it's, it's just remarkable the difference between the vaccinated and unvaccinated. Yeah. The unvaccinated people, mm -hmm. 
that's been, you know, for a long time we were about 80%, but in the last week it's been about 90, 95% are unvaccinated. Yeah. And a hospitalization of death is just all about unvaccinated people. There's yeah. very few vaccinated people. Yeah, and you and I discussed this yesterday a, a couple times in a couple different meetings. Yep. You know, I think the moral of the story continues to be that vaccines work, vaccines continue to work. It is a pandemic of two populations of vaccinated and unvaccinated, where the unvaccinated are the vast majority of the people that are hospitalized and dying. And I don't know if you brought up some of that information that came out yesterday about the South Africa with the 30% effectiveness at infection and 70 or 80% effectiveness of the vaccine at hospitalization. But I think if we remember back to when the vaccines were first rolled out, especially after that six month time period, everybody was up in arms because they said, well, now the vaccine only has a 30 or 40 percent efficacy against infection. So really, I think those numbers and not having been able to read the journal article itself and the limitations of that journal article, those to me are exactly the same that we saw a few months ago after about six months of that vaccine rollout. The main point of that is if you are vaccinated, you still have a significantly reduced chance of going to the hospital. And just think about that. It's no different than influenza. Yeah. Getting an influenza vaccine doesn't stop you from getting influenza. It just reduces how sick you're going to get and, and the likelihood of get a, a dying or having to be hospitalized. And COVID vaccination, same exact story. So um, I think that the, re- the remarkable thing here is that the vaccinations have been this in endurable and durable mm-hmm. already and continue to protect us. But, man, if your mask is off, Dr. Mm-hmm. Barr, Things are things are bad. Is Omicron still going to respond to mask wearing? Do you think? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I I mean this is this is just like one on one with COVID, right? And we've talked about this <laughs> so many times, but but it's man, I I can't tell you how often uh, you know you see people in situations that are that are very risky without masks and. Uh, Man, if you want to protect yourself uh, and and uh, to a greater degree protect the people you love and just people you don't know but don't want to hurt, um, mask, mask. It's so easy and it's it's so effective. It's it's something you can do for your community that will help those numbers look better and stop that trend from going straight upward. Mm-hmm. So, Stephen, a great point. I think that you're bringing up. It's those non-pharmaceutical interventions, those things that we've been doing since the beginning. Uh, There is a a graph here um, or an image from Kansas City Star. I think this was in there yesterday. If you see that final line on the right side there, that vertical line that shows when mask mandates or masking really stopped um, globally here around the community. um, Every single time it's the same result. And we see that increase in cases. But we are dealing with the hospitalizations from that week or a couple weeks later still. Um, those are the cases that we're dealing with. And thank you to Anthony and, and Logan in there to get that. So I think that is a, another great point is a lot of this, and we're seeing a lot of spread. I think the huge component is that human behavior. Yeah. And I'll tell you on our CMO call yesterday, man, the numbers are just continuing to rise just as they are continuing to rise here. So, uh, Dr. Satterwhite. Yes. As I actually- you- I have, can I can I tell you something that I'm thinking about? You bet. So when we talk about human behavior, the other thing that I am thinking about a lot is people need to more liberally test themselves. They people need to really pay attention to their symptoms, yeah. even if they're mild. Um, uh, we do know that CDC does have a tool. It's called the coronavirus self checker. It's just a guide to when you might want to get tested, when you might want to seek care. Um, Anytime but, you're sick, go ahead. But yeah, so I, I do <laughs> think like we want to err on the side of caution. I mean, that's what we're trying to do with promoting right. mask use. If you have a sniffle and you're like, two years ago, I don't care, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. You need to be really aware of your symptoms and get tested if there's even the smallest hint mm-hmm. um, that you might have have COVID. Well, and since the, the, the at-home testing has gotten to be so sophisticated, so good. In fact, yesterday, I think the CDC said, gosh, we're really nervous about holiday gatherings. We think people who are coming together for the holidays should all test before they get together. Yeah. All right. So I've got to go some shorts of CDC things. My mother-in-law, hope you're listening out, out there, uh, Nani, um, is 89 years old. Hope she's going to, you know, we're planning on gathering, gathering for Christmas. We all need to get tested on the day before or the day of the morning of or something. And let's just be sure. Yep. Um, I mean, I keep I keep a stash at home yep. um, because it's a Can really easy thing. I your stash thing? if I can't find any? 
No. Okay, fine. I mean, if you're really nice to me. <laughs> oh, that's not possible. <laughs> oh, I mean, um, it's a really easy thing, though. Um, the the over-the-counter tests that you can buy at the pharmacy are, um, it's a giant Q-tip, but you just swirl it around the inside of your nose. Um, you know, my kids have done it. I've done it. It's really easy. The directions are very nice. They've got pictures. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think that you just be really aware. And if you're having symptoms, stay home until you get tested. That would be now, super the awesome. struggle, of course, is that for a lot of people, that's still not affordable. So, what are what yeah. are things? What else, how else can you get tested? That's about? a really good question. Um, so, there are still um, free testing sites, um, and there's there's a variety of ways to access. Those. I think KDHE, um, the Kansas Department of Health Environment, does have a website that would help you access that. There are a lot of efforts right now to um, reimburse people for the cost of over-the-counter tests. Um, so honestly, it is something that is an imperfect system still, yep. um, but there is movement to try to make it more accessible. Secretary Bracera, um, the, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, did talk yesterday about how we may need additional federal funds to really make sure that everybody can get tested. Yeah, it's a big deal. All right, Jess, we've been talking along because there's been a big news cycle around COVID and Omicron and, mm -hmm. and uh, Delta mm -hmm. and, and new therapeutics coming out. So, you know, what I want our audience to have heard so far is we're really concerned about numbers. We know how to stop the spread and bend the curve. And there is a reason to be optimistic. So three big messages coming out of this program. Let's answer questions. All right. Yeah. And I think our viewers are equally concerned. But Tanya has a question. I know Dr. Barr mentioned it and we've talked about it this morning, but if Omicron is more transmissible, are the tools that we've been using like the six foot distancing and the masking and the staying away from crowds, is that really working? Or um, as several people have asked, should we be doing more? Well, let's, first of all, let's just take the, let's remember that Delta was much more transmissible than the original strain, like markedly more, and yet the rules of infection control still work. And we also know that, as I CD said again yesterday, just go outside. If you can, weather permitting, if it's another 60 degree on Christmas Day, hey, spend a lot of it outside because so much safer. But I think all those rules are still going to work. Yeah, they'll still work. I mean, you know, the distancing thing, might you want to, you know. 10 feet instead yeah, of 6 feet? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Okay. Be further apart. That's okay. Do that. <laughs> I mean, if, if that's if that's the question, that's okay. But the masks will still work. And, and I would just continue to emphasize that. Um, Outside, absolutely. Any any bit you can spend outside puts your risk way down real quick. So keep using those things. The distance you might want to do a little more, but that's you know that's total conjecture. It's just you know if you want to be on the safe side, that's a good way to do it. And Hawkeye, all infectious diseases fall into this category, mm -hmm. right? It's not just the uh, COVID, but we can also yeah. help influenza and all those other things. Yeah, you know, I, I currently I just have some inherent problems with that use of more transmissible. Though that term or that phrase, it is kind of. Uh, been taken up by by the media and the general public now, but I think we have to really understand exactly what that means. And you know, there are those amino acid substitutions in Spike. There are those changes. We know that Delta, you know, maybe packages more of the genomic material in there into one virus, so you maybe are, are replicating more. I think we are still learning out about those uh, biological and, and clinical relevances of those changes. But really what doesn't change is those effect of the non-pharmaceutical interventions such as distancing, masking, and of course vaccination. And going outside. Yep. Okay. Okay, Deb and Sharon have similar questions. Deb is asking, is there a home test recommended over another? And Sharon asking, what is the name of those over-the-counter oh, tests? Right. Well, so first, Dr. Sutter, which one did you have at home? I have, um, so I have the Binax now. Um, there are other tests available and they do work um, CDC does have a website and you could also access FDA to understand which tests have um, emergency use authorization to be able to be used at home yeah so there be, are there are several help. yeah any other thoughts yeah actually exactly the same that's the stash I have yep. too but that's not because they're in you guys have a best. stash and I don't have yeah. a stash we're saying? talking about they stash were available. We're they thinking ahead. Still be. Yeah. I, they were thinking ahead. I got a bunch. Of, I did buy some KN95 masks. So I'm going to make that confession because I was a little nervous, and so I said, "Yeah, I'm going to get some K95 masks." But uh, uh, so I've got those. I got a stash. I'll trade you something. You know, it could be. We have kids. 
that are young yeah. at home. Yeah, that's, that's true. probably and, true, uh, too. It's my two-year-old and four-year-old tend to have boogers a lot. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, do. Yeah. <laughs> my wife, well, my wife probably thinks I have a lot of boogers, but <laughs> 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 sorry, dear. <laughs> Love you. Okay. <laughs> when is she coming on this program sometime? She has to seem like a real person. Uh, I haven't I done that one yet. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Seitz, people ask when she's coming on and how she's doing, so I think she's doing great. that needs to um, happen. We'll, we'll get that happening. Okay, so I do have a question for Chelsea. A couple of questions, actually. Nancy uh, has donated blood several times, four or five times in, in the last year. So we gotta help her feel better about this. She had a bad experience last time, Chelsea. Um, three people poking around. She ended up bleeding pretty bad down her arm. She was just trying to figure out, is that kind of a one-time fluke thing? She has a fear now of going back and donating and we don't need that. So how can we help her out? What was that all about? Yeah, I understand that fear completely. Um, I've had similar situations happen to me before, but that is very rare that that happens. Uh, our staff are extensively trained, so probably more than even hospital staff, they are constantly sticking donors. So um, when I say that that's rare, I mean, I mean that. This specific situation, I don't know the details surrounding it. Um, it could have been that uh, we couldn't find a vein. It's that that's kind of what it sounds like to me. Um, if you've donated five times with us before uh, this year alone, thank you for that, by the way. Um, it sounds to me like most of those donations were successful and this one was a fluke. Uh, we're sorry that happened. It does happen occasionally, but that is an incredibly rare um, thing to happen. And, uh, when you and do Chelsea, in, let me be clear. She did not say she got that from you, by the way. She didn't necessarily say it was at your blood bank. She was just saying she has donated. So I just want to be clear. She wasn't saying that. She just wants to make sure that, you know, wherever she had that done, that that wasn't something that could happen again. And, and Chelsea, just to just ask, so for example, Saturday morning, are you open? Yes, we are. What time do you open? Seven. We open seven. at seven. And how long does it usually take to get blood? It usually takes about an hour to get through registration all the way to the end when you're having refreshments. When you are actually on the bed uh, donating blood, that process only takes about 10 minutes. Okay, so will there be a line on Saturday morning? I hope so. We <laughs> haven't seen a line out the door in a long time, but okay. I hope there's a line out the door this weekend. <laughs> all right, I'll see if I can get over there. Are you gonna be there? On Saturday, I'm not, but our phlebotomist will. That's what's Excellent. Important. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll send Nancy down there. Maybe she'll run into Dr. Stites in line. There you go. But Nancy, go head down there this weekend and they will take very good care of you. That won't happen there. Okay. So Amanda wants to know, is there a type of blood donation that's needed more than others? I know you say, come everyone, but anything specific? Yeah, that's hard to answer right now. I would say um, we, we really do need everything, uh, but platelets are um, also, that's a huge need that we have as well. A platelet donation takes a little bit longer than a whole blood donation, so it's harder to get donors in the door for that. But platelets only last five days, so we can't freeze them, we can't replicate them, they can't be um, made in a lab. We have to get that from a, a blood donor. So. Uh, platelet donations are incredibly needed right now. Um, we're really low on that. However, if you are an O donor, if you have an O neg or O pos blood type, please donate red blood cells. That is all we need from you. We need that desperately. We're sitting at around a two to three day supply of O's, which is just too low for us. So um, I would say uh, come in and donate any type of uh, blood donation. If you're interested in donating platelets, ask our staff about that when you come in. So really, you're too low for O. Yes, we're too not low for bad. O. Come resist. on, people! I could I could not walk away from that. <laughs> okay, uh, Joyce has a just, question. Just, just can't believe it. Really, she's like, "Who is that, Keith, that goof?" <laughs> oh, I know who he is. I yeah. know you. Okay, it's trouble. Uh, Dr. Hawkinson, just a clarification. Um, Joyce on YouTube is asking. Yesterday, you had mentioned that it is best to start. Paxlovid, is that the COVID pill, within three days of first experiencing symptoms. But she's like, I mean, sometimes it's hard to even get a COVID test back in three days. So can you comment on what you meant by that and what's, the, what's that best window? Yeah, you know, again, I don't think we have really seen any of the full data set just from what has been reported by the company. Uh, and I agree with you. I think it is very difficult, especially if you just start to develop a little bit of runny nose maybe. Um, in that first day or day and a half, and then maybe it takes you a day to get tested. 
I think they did open that window to possibly five days as well, but that's a great point, and that is one of the other concerns I had as well. So I think that's a very good point. We will wait and see the full data set, but the best effect, I believe, that was reported by the company was that it's three days from symptom onset, um, with maybe that window going to five days. Yeah, they pushed out more data, but they haven't given us all the information yet, and we knew that's going to happen when they go to the early use authorization and give yes, it to the FDA. Yes, it, it will. Um, that's something the FDA will re review. And yes, mm -hmm. the preliminary data did look also very good for five days. Yeah. And I would say, and I'll ask Dr. Barr to comment after this, that this is not any different than any of the other therapies that we have, whether it's monoclonal antibody, whether it's remdesivir, Earlier therapy, especially in that viral stage of disease, which typically lasts seven to 10 days for most people, and after that you get into the inflammatory stage and that's when people start coming to the hospital. But getting in that viral stage is going to be the, the main important factor here. And so that's why earlier is always better. So it's really the viral replication stage, right? When the virus is really spreading, then it gets into doing its damage with the inflammation. So if we can slow down replication, yeah, that's, that's usually exactly the right. That's what we're hoping to do with this therapy. That's what we hope to do with monoclonal antibodies. I, I would just say, you know, that is a tight window. That's going to be hard a lot of times. Yeah. So that should reemphasize a couple points, right? One is Dr. Satterwhite's point. If you have symptoms, get tested and do it quickly. Um, and secondly, get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. If you want to, you know, you want to do your best to stay out of the hospital, all those sorts of things, um, that's your very best way to do it. Try to prevent it in the first place. And if you do have a concern, if you do have some symptoms, get tested right away because the faster we can get you those types of antiviral therapies, the more likely we're going to have success in keeping you out of the hospital. Andy on YouTube is asking, do you think it's safe to swim in hotel swimming pools? Oh, I think swimming is actually really safe. There's so many, you know, this question is coming to me from patients. You just think <laughs> about that, that, that air, water mix and how there's such a current from the water and it's warm and it's humid yeah. and there's all sorts of funny air currents. So my bet, Hawkeye, yeah. is swimming inside, still pretty safe. I mean, I think for COVID, it's fine. I think for other things, you're always kind of rolling the dice. You never know who else has been in there. But I would also emphasize, if you have any open wounds, please don't go in there. We know that there are a lot of environmental water uh, or environmental bacteria that especially uh, like those, those water areas as well. So as long as you don't have any open wounds, Overall, I think it's probably safe for most people. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's probably pretty safe. I, yeah, I'd worry more about um, lounging the around the pool. You yeah, know, hot like tubs. How and, close there you go. Yeah, those are different questions, you know, different yeah. questions. But yeah, you know, yeah but for COVID, yeah. Taylor wants to know how many of the patients in the hospital with COVID were given monoclonal antibodies early on in their diagnosis before they were hospitalized? Do we know anything about that? Yeah, I mean, we don't know. I can't say exactly yeah. who's in the hospital right this minute, right? Um, that's, can't do that. But what I can tell you is, uh, it, you know, we look at this data, I look at it myself every month, see where we're at, and the monoclonal antibodies are doing a, a really good job keeping a really high risk population out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something around two to 3% of folks uh, that have had monoclonal antibodies go on to be hospitalized. And that's a population that we would expect to be much higher. So at least six, seven, eight, probably more like 10 plus percent hospitalization risk. So they're, they're doing a really good job, but I will say, you know, we are keeping our eyes really close on Omicron now, and, and we do anticipate mm -hmm. we're going to have to switch products. Um, Which product do you think you'll be using? Actually? So it'll be the GSK project, product, the uh, Citrovimab. Uh -huh. um, is, is that effective against both Delta and Omicron, you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we expect it to be effective against both, uh, but, you know, we have, uh, you know, only so much of that, and so we're trying to use the other products while we have Delta still predominant because we know it's going to work there and then switch over to when we know. So you can, can get us both. a lot more GSK, is that what I'm hearing? I think that we are always um, reviewing the data to figure out what we need to send people <laughs> yeah. and trying to do it in a as, as fair a way as possible. What scares you most right now, Dr. Satterway? Um So actually, one of the things that I was thinking about, you know, we've talked a lot about COVID, but we haven't talked a lot about, I mean, we've mentioned it a little bit, the other reasons that people are in the hospital right now. So there was a report not that long ago from um, Circulation, it's a journal, um, that blood pressure has increased over the course of COVID. And we know, so people now have, ele more people have elevated blood pressure, and we know that blood pressure can lead to things like stroke and heart attack. And those are the same people that need beds in our hospitals. Um, so we also know that f flu is a little bit uncertain. Um, so I would also like to put a plug in to get your flu shot if you haven't gotten it yet. 
Um, we, we are starting to see some moderate flu activity in Kansas and Missouri. It's very early in the flu season, so we're not sure what this will look like over time. But so this is what's on my mind. Um, we mentioned there's a bunch of other circulating respiratory viruses. Yeah. This is all happening with a pandemic that looks a lot different than it did a year ago. It is happening, and just to say, there are places that are already canceling elective surgeries. For example, St. Francis, our St. Francis campus has been so full, they had to cancel half their orthopedic joint procedures this week. And uh, they've gone from 10 down to five because they didn't have enough beds. So, you know, we, we, are, we are back in the crisis yeah. stage again. Yep. We need folks to understand that. But people are so tired of it that I think the, the compliance rate around masking is just dropped like a rock. And what we know is we are setting ourselves up at this moment for perhaps the worst wave we've had in the pandemic. The only thing that will prevent that is the amount of vaccination and boosters that have been given because our behaviors are not matching the severity of where we are right now. Can I, tell, I want to tell you, share something that actually was something that was really positive for me this week. So I get all sorts of reports every day. Um, and one thing that was really striking to me is in the last seven days, 460,000 people have initiated their COVID-19 vaccine series. So, you know, I think we, we forget that um, people aren't just not getting vaccinated. There are still people that are just going through their process, getting the information they need. But that's a lot of people across that's the lot. country who are getting their first shot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not I, too I late. We were up over, yeah, weren't we right. approaching like a million, what was the number I saw a day? It's a really, is it, what is the number a day right now getting That is a good or? question. I don't know how many actual it's doses. It's gone up a lot. Are. It's like tripled in the last year. I think people are scared of Omicron. Well, people were scared of Delta. Yes. And I think people are maybe mm -hmm. having a little bit of fear about Omicron too. As they should. Okay. Yeah. Jess, one more question. Well. Okay, two more. Well, I've just two quickies. If you could <laughs> just make them quick, and then I'm, mm. I've got one last one, and it'll set you up for your final thought, I promise. Okay, Jean yes, just wants to know, I had my booster September 29th. Is it still protecting me from Omicron? What do you think, Hawk? Yeah, I mean, I think the best data that we have is that really that first three months after that additional dose or that booster dose, you are, number one, going to have your kind of maximal antibody titer before it yeah, does start to it. contract as antibody titers Sounds naturally down. do after vaccination or infection. So you are still going to have protection, but in addition to that, since that time has gone on, your uh, B cells and your T cells have continued to evolve and develop further protection against, um, against Omicron, against really all the variants that we've seen. And that is the one thing that has been consistent if you look back at the data when you look at alpha and beta and delta. The further time you get out from that initial series and then you get that booster dose, you are having a further evolution of your own immune responses. And although you may not be as protected as well against okay. infection itself after that first three months, you are still going to have really, really good protection against uh, hospitalization and severe disease because of those T cell, uh, that T cell evolution and those T cell responses that were now boosted. Uh, with, with that booster dose. So I think in that first three months, you are really still gonna have really good protection against any infection, whether that's um, asymptomatic infection or really any symptoms at all. After that, we have seen that there does tend to be a little bit of drop off, but you still have protection against hospitalization. Uh, Janice wants to know any updates on when vaccines uh, for infant to four year olds will be available. And also, can you update us on um, 12 and up boosters? Any? Dr. Satterwhite? Um, I, I, we're looking, hopefully, at first quarter of 2022. Um, there, uh, the Thank FDA you is, um, is, you know, obviously uh, well poised to be able to review those data once uh, Pfizer, probably Pfizer would likely be the first one once Pfizer would submit those data. Moderna is also doing a pediatric study, um, but I believe Pfizer might be a little bit ahead of them in terms of uh, applying for emergency use authorization. For boosters for 12 to 15 year olds, I think that's probably on a similar similar track. Uh, you know, the FDA will review that and CDC will consider it uh, when it's put before them. Um, I don't have a magic ball on that one. I don't know if uh, Dr. Barr or Dr. Hawkinson has any more insight on that. I don't have any insight. I'm just full speculation here. I imagine it is going to be safe. And then along with that, I know that it will be effective. Um, so again, that's speculation based on all the, the whole body of data that we know about in adults and in the young 
uh, the young persons that we do have data about, uh, pure speculation, but I believe it will be safe and fully effective as well. All right, Jess. I have a media question that just came through, Dr. Hawkinson. I'd like to get it in. It's from Fox mm -hmm. 4. What advice uh, do the doctors have for folks who have been out at a packed event, like the Chiefs game, for instance, ahead of the holiday gatherings with family? Do you think people should consider just staying home this year for the holidays, considering the increase in COVID? Or should they proceed with holidays as usual? Mm -hmm. Again, I think outside is probably pretty safe. Yeah. I mean, we don't know enough about some of the Omicron mm -hmm. stuff around it's, inside, outside, but I'm going to bet outside is better than inside. But again, what does the CDC yeah. say? If you're going to gather, be tested right before you gather. Yeah, I think there's all these details here. I'll try to answer quickly. You know, again, I think, first of all, outdoors is definitely much safer than the, those indoors. If you are planning to do things, we know that there are steps you can take and those layers of Swiss cheese that you can take. Number one, if you know you're going to be getting together with people, say Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, you're about 10 days out now. So I would really try to quarantine or try not to be in those public settings, especially indoors for that time. The other thing you can do is if you know you have been exposed, you know, go get a PCR test or maybe an antigen test, uh, home test at five to seven days after that exposure. And then of course, if you're gonna be doing something with, with family and friends, uh, say on the 24th or 25th, maybe get an antigen test or a home test that day or get a PCR test a day or two before that time. So there are things you can do. Um, certainly I'll, I'll be traveling, uh, so I think it's important if you know that you are doing things, especially with those people that are maybe higher risk, then you probably want to hold back from some of those social events right now. You know, not necessarily quarantine yourself, but just take another, uh, another look at do you really want to do that or are you trying to protect yourself as much as possible for those next and remember, you can wear a mask, you can do the things to keep you safe, so that helps. Yeah, and I just have one more comment. Um, the other thing that I think is really important as we approach the holiday season is to have open and honest conversations with the people that you might be gathering with. You know, have you had an exposure? Are you vaccinated? Do you have any symptoms? Mm -hmm. You know, we have to get comfortable with having uncomfortable conversations, and it's really important if we want to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe. Okay, Jess. Doctor, uh, I think you answered both of those media questions, so I'll leave you with this. Isaac wants to know, will there ever be a time when this is over? Please tell me so. So maybe that can no, set you up for some final no, thoughts. No, I, I think it is going to be over. I think it, what, mm -hmm. what, what, what are the requirements to be over? So let, let's think about that as we hit final thoughts. We'll go around the horn. I think, who am I supposed to start with today? We'll, we're going to start with mm -hmm. Dr. Satterwhite. Um, I think that we are all in a space where we are adapting to what will be a new normal. I know that that's a term that has been used often. Um, the coronavirus was around before. It will be around afterwards. We have to get to a place where it is just part of our normal life. And I, yes, I think that will happen where we will get to a place where it doesn't feel like we're always putting out fires. Um, but we have to get through this holiday season. We need to get through this variant. We need to get more people vaccinated and adopt that culture of paying attention to yourself and the people around you. All right, Dr. Sa Dr. Barr. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I think we are, we will get to a place where this is sort of, um, yeah, less intense, less constantly battling against the next, you know, the next wave, all this sort of stuff. We're gonna get to that place. But here's the thing, in the meantime, people are dying, right? We're seeing people in our hospital, um, you know, some that were previously uh, really healthy and, and that are dying, some, some that are previously really healthy and never are quite the same so far. Um, so while we're waiting for that, we gotta do everything we can to try to keep ourselves safe and to try to keep our community safe. So I get that some of this stuff is annoying. I get that um, everybody's sick of masking, everybody's sick of having to think so hard about you know, every, every encounter they might wanna do, but what is the goal? The goal is to keep yourself healthy, the ones you love healthy, the goal is to keep people you've never met but probably don't want to harm healthy. So we, we got to think about, about that first. And then remember, yeah, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, but let's make sure we get there in a smart way that's going to make sure as few of people as possible get this awful disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I, I think that's great. I agree with both of our guests here. You know, looking at it just from the human virus interaction, you know, our body is adapting and evolving to this. And I think that is spurred on and improved by the vaccinations, just because of what Dr. Barr said. Anytime you get this infection, even if you're healthy, you're rolling the dice with those complications, whether it's the blood clots or death or long COVID. We know vac vaccination is going to help reduce 
those risks of that. And so that is the way through it. As we move in, if you remember, uh, most people don't, but in the 1918 flu epidemic, that lasted for three or four years, actually. So I think we are going to continue to be dealing this with this, but I think uh, we as a species and society are going to be able to adapt but vaccination is going to help that adaptive process and that evolutionary process to keep as many people safe out of the hospital and dying as possible. But I don't have a good uh, crystal ball or vision as to when we will get back to say closer to 2019 as opposed to 2020, but vaccination is going to be the way that we are going to get there quicker with less loss of life. So. Chelsea, I'm going to give you the next to final word before I before I take it and, and hand it to Jess. Go ahead. And I think you want to give us some information about how to get an appointment set up. Yes, absolutely. So first, I do want to um, mention that we are aware that this messaging has been, you've been hearing us say this for two years now almost. Um, this can't be our new normal. Uh, we do, I, I do agree that I think some of this um, is going to stick around for quite some time, but a blood shortage isn't something uh, that, can, can, that can remain. So uh, we are pleading with you to come in and donate blood, please make an appointment immediately. You can call us at 877-468-6844 or visit savealifenow.org. You can search uh, for locations via zip code. We have blood drives and donor centers all across the metro area. We're trying to make it as easy as possible for you to come in. Um, my final thought is that the only thing that is going to um, bring us out of this blood shortage are blood donors. So please come in, please donate. Uh, it's very needed right now. Yeah, in the midst of a crisis, we still need your help, don't we? Uh, we need all of everybody's help. So, you know, this is a funny time because you just want to be done with it. And we hoped uh, a year ago that vaccination would help take us out of that wilderness. And it has. We hope that there wouldn't be a variant like this. But Omicron's come along. We also know this about evolution. Evolution is a fickle tie. It's a fickle beast sometimes. And, uh, and, these, and these viruses do evolve. They do change. But viruses don't really do well if they try to kill their hosts. Because then they can't do what they're meant to do, which is to reproduce and, 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 and spread. So we know that um, the, the, the overwhelming genetic and evolutionary pressure on viruses is to become more spreadable and less severe. We're hoping that Omicron is a step in that way. We don't know yet. What we do know is we need folks to still protect themselves. So when you think about how to say, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, you have to ask yourself, what's the best way to do that? Is it to act like it's 2019 or is it to act like it is 2021 and that we are in the midst of the greatest health crisis we faced across the world in many generations? If we act like the latter, We'll follow the rules of infection control and we'll bend the curve. Ultimately, getting to normal will require all of us to think about it the same way. Vaccination, follow the rules, and as Paxlovid and other pills come out, take your meds. At the end of the day, that will lead us out of this wilderness. And it's not a forever. It may still be the day after tomorrow. But there is hope, there is a way forward, and we know what to do, and we've done it before. So say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, but really mean it, and let's be here for many more to come. Jess. All right, Dr. Seitz, well said. So tomorrow on the show, this is really great. You're gonna meet some Pleasant Hill students whose teacher gave them a special assignment related to the pandemic. These students have their eyes on careers in medical professions and their insight and stories are truly remarkable. You will enjoy hearing from our young guests tomorrow. So have a great day and we'll see you at eight. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.